All right, well, I'm gonna talk next about uh, how to best select doublet versus triplet therapy. And I think this is a great opportunity in a forum like this where there's expert opinion to uh, try to come up with some consensus statements here to help our urologists and oncologists with this difficult dilemma. So uh, first thing I wanna do is tell you what not to do. And this, I think most everybody here knows that ADT monotherapy, there's plenty of data now that will tell us that uh, that ADT plus androgen pathway inhibitors are superior with regards to overall survival and radiographic progressive free survival. Uh, I'm not gonna tell you that I never use ADT monotherapy. Uh, there, I think, are still roles for it. Uh, example would be the, the 92, 94 year old guy who uh, has metastatic castrate sensitive prostate cancer and you're really worried that this guy may actually die from prostate cancer. And so you may not want to treatment intensify, but at least get him on ADT. So that might be an example where ADT monotherapy might be useful, but for the most part, it's, it's fallen out of favor. And then even ADT plus dose of Taxil, going back to the charted data, NCCN guidelines now no longer recommend this doublet therapy since we have triplet therapy that's superior. So doublet therapy for metastatic castrate sensitive disease versus ADT alone. This is the timeline here. It all began with charted around 2015. You can see we had latitude with abiraterone plus ADT. And this was really a, a significant opening of the door for urologists uh, to be able to treat patients with metastatic castrate sensitive because this was a, an oral therapy as opposed to a, a, a cytotoxic chemotherapy. Uh, Further on down the, down the road, you see Titan and then Arches, which are the two most commonly quoted trials in doublet therapy with uh, ADT plus an androgen pathway inhibitor. So looking at Titan, this is the apalutamide plus ADT versus ADT alone. This is the doublet therapy. You can see the Kaplan-Meier there in the final analysis with significant separation of the curves. The median overall survival was not estimable versus 52 months. Hazard ratio was very good at 0.65. There was a 35% risk reduction. In this trial, there was significant crossover on the control arm to patients. About 40% of patients still went on to receive apalutamide later on in the trial. So with that crossover adjustment, it was close to a 50% improvement in overall survival. And then with the RPFS, a 52% reduction. And then ARCHES was similarly designed. This was enzalutamide plus ADT versus ADT alone. Similar results here, similar appearance to the uh, Kaplan-Meier curve, you have a 34% risk reduction overall survival, and the RPFS risk reduction was over 60%. So again, this is very strong evidence that uh, in these patients with metastatic castrate-sensitive disease that ADT alone is simply not good enough. When we look at the triplet therapy, we, the two most commonly uh, quoted uh, trials are the PEACE-1 and the Aerosens. So PEACE-1 was abiraterone and prednisone plus standard of care. Initially, standard of care was ADT. It turned out midway through the trial that standard of care was not ADT. It was ADT plus docetaxel. So the data uh, really uh, looks at that particular aspect of it. And then with Aerosens, the triplet is the darolutamide plus docetaxel plus ADT versus docetaxel plus ADT, which was the standard of care at the time that was the doublet therapy with, with uh, chemotherapy with ADT based on the charted data. These were all de novo patients, so synchronous patients with metastatic castrate sensitive disease. A lot of people feel that these are uh, more refractory, a little bit tougher to treat. Uh, they got the abiraterone and prednisone plus standard of care, which turned out to be docetaxel plus ADT. And the docetaxel population, the triplet versus doublet, the hazard ratio was 0.75. You see the median overall survival difference there on the, uh, on the right. And the upper chart, the upper graph there shows that Kaplan-Meier and then the uh, piece one interim analysis, also very good separation with the RPFS. In this patient population, you could argue, and I, I commonly do, that RPFS actually has more impact than OS. Uh, these patients, what our goal is with these patients is to prevent uh, castrate resistance, because once they enter into that castrate resistance space, it's like starting the clock all over again. We want to keep them in metastatic castrate sensitive as long as we can, and that's really what our PFS is. Uh, o OS, you know, a lot of my patients will say, you know, I'm not necessarily interested in living longer if I feel worse. And so, uh, to me, the RPFS data is very, very robust here. Um, and then, the, I think one of the pearls when we look at trying to decide who is best treated with doublet versus triplet is to look in the yellow box below there, the overall survival benefit did appear to be more pronounced in patients with higher volume disease. And when we look at Aerosens, uh, 
I think that the, the big issue here, the slight difference is you had uh, some recurrent patients or metastasis patients which were included in the trial, uh, and these are a little bit less refractory to treatment. Some of these patients have been in this journey of advanced prostate cancer for 25 or 30 years now, and now they've progressed into metastatic castrate sensitive disease. Uh, so these were patients that received docetaxel plus darolutamide plus ADT versus the standard at the time, which was the docetaxel plus ADT. They got their six cycles of docetaxel, or that was the at least intent, and then the darolutamide was started within six weeks. Uh, these, are t these were tough to treat patients. They included 17% of patients with visceral metastasis. Uh, these are typically very refractory. And then when you look at overall survival hazard ratio of 0.68, that's pretty significant. And the RPFS also hazard ratio of 0.36. When you also look at, um, the, on the bottom right there, 76% of patients that were taking the uh, placebo plus ADT with docetaxel did receive subsequent life prolonging antineoplastic therapy, which is what we typically see in this stage of patients that are going through this journey. In the bottom left, uh, again, to look at what we might be able to come up to take from this versus uh, when we look at doublet versus triplet therapy, the overall survival benefit was more pronounced in the de novo and high volume with the caveat that the low, there were low patient numbers in the recurrent and low volume subgroups. So these are the common questions that I typically get from my colleagues and and this is, I think, where our future directions needs to go. So since there are no published trials comparing ADT plus an androgen pathway inhibitor with docetaxel versus ADT plus the androgen pathway inhibitor, how much does the addition of docetaxel really matter, and is it worth the toxicity? So we need to really figure out, you know, if we're going to add docetaxel, which subgroup of patients is really the best suited for that? And then why are there not clearer guidelines? I get this all the time. People come to me and say, well, how do you decide which patients really should have doublet versus triplet therapy? And you know, there are suggestions out there, but no one's really stepped forward and really given any clear guidelines. So when we look at risk stratification, I think that that's one of the areas that we can go with this. And this goes back to the 2017 latitude criteria where we where we define high-risk disease, you can see there greater than two of those risk factors is primarily patients with higher volume bone metastases with or without visceral metastases. And then the low-risk patients are really those that just don't have that. And so I think that we can take an extension of a risk stratification and try to try to um, apply that to the metastatic castrate sensitive group. And we know that there's going to be patients that are clearly in the high risk, and there are patients that are clearly in the low risk. And then there's that group in between. That's the art, if you will, of the management of these patients as opposed to the science. And so high risk certainly would be patients with visceral metastasis. I think that nobody would argue with you that a patient that has liver metastasis or pulmonary metastasis with metastatic castrate sensitive disease, if they can tolerate it, would be better suited for uh, triplet therapy. Patients with very high volume disease, patients that have de novo disease, as I mentioned earlier, these can be more refractory to, to treatment, and especially patients that have de novo disease that are younger. And then don't forget about the the bespoke aspect of all this, the HR germline or somatic mutations. And when we have patients that present particularly with BRCA mutations, whether they're germline or somatic, these patients are extremely refractory and they're going to require a lot more treatment intensification. And I would include them in the high risk group as far as determining whether you would go with a, a, a doublet versus triplet. And then the other patients that come in that walk in the door, many of our patients with metastatic castrate sensitive disease walk in the door and they feel absolutely fine. They had no idea that they had a problem. But those that have high degree of symptoms that need quick resolution of those symptoms may benefit from triplet therapy. On the contrary, the low risk patients would be maybe those that have the bone or lymph node only disease, lower volume disease, the patients that have recurrent disease, that patient that had the radical prostatectomy 25 years ago, salvaged radiation 20 years ago, it's been perking along with very low risk BCR, if you will, that patient comes in now with recurrent disease with metastatic castrate sensitive, those are gonna be lower risk. Patients that don't have those germline or somatic mutations and maybe those that are asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic. And then I'll throw in the SPOT mutation, which 
uh, have been shown that these patients' tumors are driven predominantly through androgen signaling, just the opposite of what Dan was talking about earlier with, a, with um, um, the other group of patients that tend not to respond well to androgen signaling. These S-pot mutations do. And uh, I actually just saw one the other day who had an, andro who had an s pot mutation who had been on first-line ARI. And ordinarily, I would not switch to another ARI, but in this case, I'm going to because of his s pot mutation. Other associated factors to consider, you can see them here. And this, again, this is the art of deciding. This is that, that be, the, between the lines of the high-risk and low-risk patients, looking at patient preference, their chronological versus physical age, performance status. Some patients just are not fit for chemo, other comorbidities and drug-drug interactions. Some patients don't have availability to medical oncology or chemotherapy. Some have to drive hours to get to that type of, of uh, uh, practice and their work schedule or other obligations may interfere with their ability to do triplet therapy. And then don't forget about cost and the financial toxicity associated with these therapies. And physician preference and experience may be even the most important aspect of this decision-making process. And then lastly, I pulled this out of an ASCO Daily News, and it really does, I think, nicely uh, help us look at doublet versus triplet therapy, and it highlights a lot of the things that I've talked about here. On the left, you've got the, the higher volume uh, patient that, that may require more treatment intensification. On the right, you can see the other factors there that I've already talked about. The uh, one thing that I didn't mention earlier was the non-optimal PSA response. PSA nadir is important. It, has, it does correlate significantly with overall survival. And in patients that get started on androgen deprivation therapy and maybe an androgen pathway inhibitor as well, those patients that get a PSA 90 or a PSA undetectable within three to six months after initiation of therapy do tend to do much better. Patients that haven't reached that nadir maybe uh, would be a higher risk and might be patients that would, you would think would be uh, better suited for triplet therapy. So, um, and I think that, again, this is an area that we can focus on maybe in our discussion uh, session on some consensus here on how we can help our colleagues decide what's best, triplet or double therapy, in, the, in each particular subgroup of patients.